just had this excitement in my heart, just this stirring in my heart and excitement and just a momentum that is building up and God, God's been reminding me of um, the anticipation of a preparation of a wedding and um, just this anticipation and I've just seen like a bride next to a bridegroom <laughs> and I just I've been feeling this this excitement in my heart of um, this anticipation of <laughs> just this romance this momentum and I just feel like Whatever is caught up between us and him right now, just lay it down. Just put it aside. He is drawing us. He is drawing his bride into such a place of readiness. It's like this preparation for this marriage feast. And the bride has made herself ready. And it, it, there's just such an excitement that I believe the Holy Spirit is just stirring up in our hearts. And I don't fully know what this is going to look like because I know we are already the bride. But I feel this is a time of romance and that the Holy Spirit wants us lost, totally and absolutely lost in His embrace. Totally aware of our union and the excitement and the anticipation of our bridegroom king, the consummation, the fullness of the awareness of that oneness with him. So my title today is, as you can see, One with Jesus. So... We, were, we had the privilege of being um, with Trish and myself on a Midlands farm a week ago, and we, we were able to spend the whole week on the farm, and uh, we had a lot of um, just quiet time, good time with the Lord, just walking on the farm and just meditating on life and praying together. And, um, you know, the one thing that... Um, you know, that, that is so obvious, is just, just how people live life. And, um, and really, just that's, that's really what I want to speak about today, because, you know, as I was just looking at, at, you know, farms all around, people just working hard, and, you know, it's good to work hard, but people toiling, and, you know, what came to me is, you know, Ecclesiastes, where Solomon meditated on what's it all about and you know he spoke about that you know he he accumulated wealth more wealth than probably anybody in the world at that time certainly and um, he planted vineyards he plant he he built um, palaces and planted gardens yeah and um so he looked at all of that and he said, it's meaningless. At the end of his life, he looked at it and he said, it's meaningless. In other words, he was not fulfilled by all of that. And, you know, honestly, when we look at, at um, the world, you know, there's so much toiling. And Habakkuk 2.13 says that it was, was not God's will that the nations toil for the fire. But the time is coming when the knowledge of the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So, in other words, what we see at the moment, this is not what God's plan was. And the knowledge of his glory will bring mankind into rest. And just as I meditated, so Lord, what, is, what, is, what did you intend, you know, us to live on this earth? What did you actually intend? And I really felt... The Lord saying the highest, our highest, um, the highest life we can ultimately live is living one with Him. So it's not about you know people 
accumulate wealth and then they go, you know, I've also dreamt about that, you know, they are, I love traveling. Trish and I have traveled quite a bit, especially into the Middle East, to the islands. We've seen beautiful islands. And um, so it's, it's lovely. I mean, the earth is, is beautiful. But, you know, people travel and um, all over the world and, and they still come back unfulfilled with all that beauty. And we had the privilege of spending um, some time once in, a, in an island called Palawan. And um, right in the northern tip, there's a, a town called El Nido. And it's a tourist destination. It is beautiful. People go there and they snorkel and there are coral reefs. And it's just stunning. And, um, but when Trish and I went there, we went on a mission trip. And so we got to... We got to mix with the locals, and we were ministering to them in their homes. We ate with them in their homes. We ministered to, you know, the, the families. And honestly, I wouldn't have changed with anybody, any of the tourists there, because the tourists were just, you know, partying. And, and really, when I looked at them, I didn't see fulfillment in them. You know, I really believe. So... I'm not saying it's it's not enjoyable to travel, to enjoy those things, but that's not what life is all about. And like I said, like Solomon said, it's meaningless. And his ultimate conclusion was fear God and keep his commandments. And I really believe in the New Testament that translates to, to living one with God because God has actually reconciled us back to himself so that we can live in union with them. And we know even in the Old Testament, you know, it says Enoch walked with God and he was not. So he, he actually walked with God for 300 years before God took him. But um, that was amazing because that's the Old Testament. But the Bible says, like I just prayed now, the Bible says God has reconciled us to himself in the body of his son. So we are already united with him. So God never intended mankind to live in the, independent of him. And so Adam and Eve, like we know, the, the Bible says, before the fall, they lived in the presence of God, naked and unashamed in his presence. They lived like children in the presence of God. And, you know, the Bible says, the, in the presence of God is fullness of joy. So there was no lack in God's presence. He created us to live there. <laughs> sure. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he created us to live. <laughs> created us to live in his presence. So I just want to, what my, what I just, what I'm focused on tonight is just give us a little bit of background. I really feel we're living in such an awesome time. And, and then we just really want to trust for the Holy Spirit to demonstrate that and to, yeah, just to unveil Christ fully in each one of us. So God just said to me while we were in this awesome worship, thank you again, Leighton, and I don't know if Tanya's still here. That was absolutely amazing. Absolutely. Thanks, Leighton. Thank you, team. It was so amazing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Tanya. That was glorious. That was so good. Thank you. Thanks, Leighton. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. So God just said to me, like, we are all part of, like, an orchestra, you know, including the worship team and all of us here. And the Holy Spirit is the director of that orchestra. And he wants us to learn to live like that. So, you know, when Adam and Eve chose to believe the lie of the enemy, that everything was not good in the presence of God, and uh, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they essentially fell to living by sense and reason. And they left the presence of God. The minute they left, toiling started. And the Bible says it was not God's will that, that, that mankind would toil. And we know through the cross he has reconciled us back to himself. And now he invites us into his rest. And the rest really is 
the gospel. It's the finished work of the cross. We are already fully reconciled, and we can live one with Jesus. And really what we are finding that, um, you know, that Jesus is so faithful. You know that song, um, Stephanie Frizzell, Bethel, they sing that song, um, you are good, good, you'll never, never let me down. And God, over the last two years, he just sang that to me continually, just in my heart. And I knew he was, he was saying to me, I will never let you, let you down. You can get out the boat and walk on the water. You do not need to live by sense and reason. Or, as, a, as it translates in this world, you do not need to live by rands and sense. So, you know, the Bible says we cannot serve God and mammon. And I believe that, you know, the one thing that... Um, God is dealing with at the moment. He wants us free of mammon in terms of trusting in mammon. Okay, so God is our provider. And, you know, Trisha and I are just finding more and more that the more we're surrendering to God, the, the easier our life it become, is becoming. And, you know, Stu and Kevin have, have testified that of, of that a lot over the last couple of years that as we surrender our lives, as we let go of those things that we are holding on to through fear, that God is so faithful. And he actually, you know, the Bible says it's for freedom. Christ has set us free. So I really believe he's calling us like literally, like he did with Peter, onto the water to walk by faith in him. And, and literally to to live by total faith in him and trust him completely. So it's not serving God and mammon. So I really feel, you know, I just have on my heart that um, a couple of months ago, I've mentioned this before, God just um, said to me, like out of the blue, I heard him say, the church has crossed the Jordan River. And I was, I was quite surprised because I wasn't even thinking about that. And just a bit of context, you know, um, Chris Blackaby, many of you um, maybe experienced him a few years ago when he ministered here. He just said there's a generation, so like the second generation of Israel, you know, God took them from Egypt through the wilderness into the promised land, and eventually, you know, the second generation had enough faith in God to cross the Jordan River and go into God's promised land. And the Bible says that the Jordan River at that time backed up right up to a town called Adam. And um, so that's a prophetic picture and basically of, so Chris Blackaby said that's a prophetic picture. So that was a type and shadow. The Exodus experience was a type and shadow of the end time church where it says there's a, the, basically there's a generation that is going to take back everything that was lost since the fall, since Adam, including death, including immortality. So God didn't create mankind to die. And so, you know, when, when, Adam and, uh, sorry, when, when the Israelites crossed the Jordan River with Joshua, the first, one of the first things that happened, they met with this person that the Bible describes, Joshua met a man and um, with a drawn sword, which according to Bible commentary was actually Jesus, the Jesus of the Old Testament, who was often described as the angel of the Lord, but it was actually the visible God. Because, you know, when you, when you go on with that narrative, you see um, this person that Joshua meets, he's take your shoes off, the, um, the ground that you're standing on is holy. So he was actually talking to God. So Joshua again, so the whole book of Exodus, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 10, says that was written for our instruction for, uh, for us who live in these last days. And um, so, so Joshua, um, in the Hebrew, the word Jesus is actually Jeshua. 
We're going to play a song just now, Joshua, which is awesome. And um, so, so the Israelites, Joshua met with, with, with actually with Jesus, and he had a drawn sword. And he was basically taking the Israelites into the promised land, which was Canaan at the time. But the first generation, you know, we know the first generation got to, got to the Jordan River, and they basically, they sent in 12 spies. Ten of them came back and said, we can't do it, even after 40 years of God looking after them in the wilderness, after Mount Sinai, after, you know, the Red Sea, after, after the destroying, the, really, the nation of Egypt. They get to the promised land, they say, we can't do it. And God is a bit miffed with them. <laughs> and he says, he says, okay, you're actually not going to go into the promised land because you haven't believed in me, you're going to die in the wilderness, except for Joshua and Caleb, the only two that believed in God from, that, from those, tens, those 12 spies. And in fact, from the first generation, you will go into the promised land because you've believed in me. And then he says something very interesting. So when I first became a Christian, I saw this and the Holy Spirit really highlighted it to me. This is in Numbers 14. He says, as I live. So God says, okay, you, you've decided not to believe in me after 40 years of looking after you in the wilderness, feeding you manna, being present with you with the pillar of fire by night, cloud by day. You're still not believing. Um, but he says, so he says, you're going to die in the wilderness. But he sa- then he says something. So remember now they're going into Canaan, which is the promised land for Israel, which is a type and shadow of God, what God has in mind for the end time church. And he says, as I live, he says, but surely, he says, you're going to die in the wilderness, but surely, as I live, the earth will be filled with my glory. So he's showing there, he's not just interested in Canaan for his people. He wants the earth for his people. And, um, and then in Romans 4, it speaks about that God promised the earth to Abraham and his seed, that they will inherit the earth. Okay. So, as I said just a couple of months ago, God just said to me, the church has crossed the Jordan River. So that's obviously a spiritual uh, Jordan River. But basically, the church is on the advance to take back the earth. And guess who's leading the church? Jesus. Amen. And so, so um, last week, Thursday, as we were at the farm, I saw God gave me a vision of Jesus, and he was mobilizing his church like Revelation 19. I just want to read Revelation 19 because I believe it's very prophetic. It's it's right now where we are living right now. After this, I heard, this is Revelation 19, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are his judgments He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. So together with Jesus mobilizing his army, there's also the marriage feast of the Lamb. The two are coinciding. So I've shared before that um, Jesus has been saying to me the last four years that the bridegroom is at the door. He's right at the door and the bride is preparing herself. So like in any wedding... You know, the bride is normally the one that keeps the wedding waiting. <laughs> so right now, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll play a song just now, an awesome song by Maverick City called Getting Ready. I'm sure many of you know it. Awesome song. It speaks about that the marriage 
Feast of the Lamb, the wedding, the wedding feast is coming. So, and then it says, The angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. I saw heaven standing open, and there, there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Trish just mentioned at our last meeting last Sunday that when we were coming back um, from our visit to the Midlands, the song just came on, the rider on the white horse. Um, I'll just play it now. He has fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand and he's riding a white horse across this land. He has fire in his eyes and the sword in his hand. He's riding a white horse all across this land. And he's calling out to you and me. Will you ride with me? He has fire in his eyes. And a sword in his hand And he's riding a white horse Across this land He's calling out to you and me Will you ride with me? Will you ride with me? We say yes
You see that fire in his eyes Is his love for his bride And he's longing that she be with him Right by his side Yes, that fire in his eyes Is his burning desire That his bride be with him Right by his side Can you hear him calling out to us right now Saying we're out with me Lord, I know what I want my answer to be When you say, will you ride with me? Don't want anything down here Holding on to me When you say, will you ride with me? So, you know, like I said, it says that... um, in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, Christ must reign. So remember, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And we are in him. We are his body. We are the scepter of his rulership. And it says, Christ must reign until all his enemies are made a footstool at his feet. So he's already defeated all his enemies. We know he led a train of vanquished foes. But we are the scepter of his rulership and he's waiting for us to overcome the enemy through faith in him. And the Bible says this is the victory we have over this world, even our faith. And it says the last enemy to be overcome is death. So the church will reign over death. And I really believe this is the time we're living in now where Jesus is mobilizing his army, where it says darkness covers the earth and dense darkness the people, but the Lord will rise upon you and his glory shall rise, shall be seen on you. And nations will come to your light. So God is establishing, you know, it says about Jesus, it says in, um, Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 9, for to us a child is given, to us, a son is born, a child is, a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. So I really believe Jesus is mobilizing an army. So whatever vocation you are in, it doesn't mean you have to leave your vocation to join that army, but in, the, in your vocation, he's calling you to surrender all and to be part of his army and to live only by his voice. Thank you, Jesus. And it says of the increase of his government. So I really believe Jesus is establishing his government on earth fully at this time. Because the governments of this world have failed completely. There's chaos in the world. And Revelation speaks about The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Christ and his God, and he shall reign forever. Thank you, Jesus. And we say, yes, Lord. We say, yes, Lord. What a privilege. So he's calling us to live one with him. He's already united us with him through through the cross. Bible says we no longer live. Christ lives in us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I really believe we're living in the most awesome time that the church has ever experienced where it says the whole of creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God where creation, even creation, will be set free from its bondage to decay through the glorious liberation of the sons of God. And I believe, like it says, it says he's come. 1 Thessalonians 
2 Thessalonians 1.10 says, He's come to be glorified in those who have believed and to be marveled at in all who have believed. So there's a day of God's power at hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So as I said earlier on, I really feel, you know, when I was just meditating on the farm, that the greatest privilege and the greatest life we can ever live is to live united with God. You know, like, you know, no, no amount of wealth, no traveling the world will ever compare with living one with God. He's given us such a privilege that we can actually live united with Him moment by moment. So, you know, throughout the ages, people have sort of taken hold of that. Like, um, you know, in the 14th century, there was this lady, Joan of Arc. You've heard of her. And um, so she was a Catholic, a Catholic um, girl. And um, her whole family got killed in a war. The, Fr- the English had invade, invaded France. And her whole family got killed, including her special uh, friend and sister and um, the whole family was gone and she was left and she was I think like 12 years old and she went into a Catholic um, temple and she took the goblet of wine and there's a movie about it and she just said Jesus I want to be one with you now so she didn't understand that the cross has already united us. Jesus has already done it through the cross. But she said, Jesus, she had revelation. That's what she wanted, to be one with God. And from that moment on, like, you know, at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, Peter quoted, because as the Spirit was poured out, they became aware of Jesus has come back to them now in the form of the Spirit, and he's now come to indwell them. And Peter quotes to David, he says, I see the Lord continually before me at my right hand. So God has, has, through the cross, he has united us with himself, and he's restored us back into his presence. So we can, so we don't just see God, like David says, before us, but we can now see Jesus right inside of us. So that is, that is the freedom from the fall because the fall, Adam and Eve became self-aware. And when we're self-aware, we're always trying to fix everything and we start toiling. But God created us to live in his presence where there is no lack and to live by his voice where there's fullness of joy. Thank you, Jesus. And then, yeah, I just, I just thought of um, many years ago, I read um, Benny Hinn's book, um, Come Holy Spirit. I think it was called Come Holy Spirit. And he just spoke about, he spoke about what he used to do. He used to get on his knees and pray. And um, he spoke about, about um, the outer court, <laughs> prayer, pray, and till you get into the inner court and then the holy place and then the holy of holies. But interestingly enough, so he experienced that. So each time he prayed, he felt he needed to die to his, to his, his body, to his, his old life, and until he experienced God. And he did actually experience it. And the one thing he said, which was very interesting, he said, when you experience the holy of holies, you experience oneness with God. So God is, the awesome thing is that God has put us inside of Christ. He's inside the Father. So we live. That is our position through the cross. We are in Christ. He's in the Father, in the very center of God, in the Holy of Holies. And we can live there permanently, one with God, where there's fullness of joy. 
So, yeah, the other night, um, Trish and I were just praying, and God was just talking to me about this oneness with him, that that's his, what he's created us for. Like when I was on the farm, I asked him, so what is it all about? People just toil, 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 grow old, die, pass it on to the next generation, they do the same. It's so meaningless. <laughs> and he said to me, no, I created you to live one with me. And as, so, as um, we were just praying together, I just started seeing Jesus and Trish, like intertwined with Trish. Like I had a, like a, just a full-on vision of Jesus and Trish one. And he said, I've already united mankind to myself. So the Bible says, if one died for all, Paul got this revelation and he says, I'm beside myself with joy because the cross is so big. He said, if one died for all, all died. So in other words, when Jesus died on the cross, because he's God, all of creation, the fallen creation died with him. And when he rose from the dead, there was a new creation. In fact, a new heaven and a new earth. And we know, obviously, unbelievers don't experience that and they cannot participate on that until they believe and they can, and they can um, live, live that life. So I really feel tonight God is just calling us all, like Trish said just now, that he's calling us to lay down those things that, that are still, that we're still holding on to, that we think we have to control, and just surrender everything to him. Because he will never let you down. He is faithful and true, and he's created us to live one with him. And there is no lack in him. The ultimate life is living one with Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So like I said, God doesn't want us to live by sense and reason. It's a lower life. He wants us to live by his voice. So I was listening to Kenneth Hagan. Many of you might have heard of him. He had a church called Rama in America in the 70s. And he just spoke about walking in the Spirit. And he spoke about how Jesus appeared to him and just taught him about living in the Spirit. And he said, Jesus said to him, if you will listen, if you will live by my inward voice, I will bless you. And really, it's scriptural, you know. Uh, Deuteronomy 28 says, If you listen diligently to the voice of the Lord your God, He will set you high above all the nations of the earth. So God's got an ultimate life as we just live life in the Spirit. And, um, yeah, he said, he just testified, Kenneth Hagin just testified, he said since that time when he, as he learned to live in the Spirit, he said God's just made him so wealthy he says not as in a billionaire but he just gives away him and his wife give away so much money he said this year he said as an example they gave away four hundred and fifty thousand dollars you know this is like 30 40 years ago so it was probably more like <laughs> a lot of money so just so i want to encourage you you know that thing that we, we think we have to be in control God just says, let it go. And we're just learning to do that. And as we're learning to do it, we're just finding God so faithful. So Hebrews 3 and 4 talks about it. Says, he invites us. He says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, but strive to enter his rest. So his rest is just coming into agreement with what he's already done through the cross. So he's already fully united us with himself. And you can imagine God owns the universe. So the Bible says, Hebrews 1, says Jesus is the heir and lawful owner of everything. So it's amazing. He owns everything. 
So, you know, people can say, I've got real estate. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> it actually belongs to Jesus. It doesn't belong to you. Hey, they're squatting. <laughs> they're squatting. Very good. They're squatting. So, and then it goes on to say in Romans 8, it says we are heirs and we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ and share. Joint heirs me means we together share in everything he has. How awesome is that? So the earth is the Lord's, the fullness of the people and they who dwell in it. So guess what? He doesn't have to ask permission to take over the earth. So I really believe, you know, like it says in Romans 4, that he's, he's actually um, given the earth to Abraham and his seed. And the Bible says we are the seed of Abraham through Jesus Christ. Okay, so Lord, we just thank you for, for your word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you confirm this word to these precious people here today and those who are listening on the medium. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we just welcome you. We just welcome you. Pray, Lord, that you just shine your light to every person's heart here and just reveal Second Corinthians 4 verse 6 says, God who spoke out of darkness has shone his light into our hearts for the illumination of the glory and majesty of God. That means God's shone his light into our hearts to show us God inside of us. Like we often say, like Simba, when he looked into that river and he saw Mufasa in him. And all fear left him. And all lower identity left him. And he realized, I'm supposed to reign. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So God who spoke out of darkness has shone his light into your hearts for the illumination of the glory and majesty of God as seen in the face of Jesus. So Jesus Christ came to reconcile us to the Father. He came as the older brother. No, not the real, not the older brother and prodigal son. He wasn't. The, but he came as, a, as the firstborn son from heaven. He came to remind us of our Father. And when we see Jesus... As he said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father and I are one. So he reminded us of who we are, of our Father, of, of the one that gave us birth. And when we look at Jesus, he mirrors who we are. Like it says, Second Corinthians 3.18, all of us as with unveiled face, as we behold, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, we are transformed. So Lord, we thank you tonight, Holy Spirit, that you show people here Jesus. And as they see Jesus in the Spirit, they see themselves mirrored in Jesus. And they are transformed because we are born of God. Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to play this song, Yeshua, now. And um, like I said, you know, we are together, the orchestra. So I've shared a bit now, but please just, if anybody's got a prophetic word, word of knowledge, or anything, Please feel welcome. Thank you, Jesus. Or a song. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We thank you, Lord, for an open heaven. Thank you that we are surrounded by angels, by a cloud of witnesses, by the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Today, we choose to get out the boat of our comfort, the boat of our fears, and to trust you, Jesus, and to walk on the water. We choose to let go of those things that we hold on to and trust you and, and live by your inner voice. Thank you, Jesus. Prophecies for 